resistant strain. Um, so yeah, that's a whole other, that could be a whole talk for an hour for sure. But I feel like I, I you know, I, I, you know, they say time flies when you're having fun and <laughs> yeah. it's fine. I've got so many questions for you. Um, I, I do want to ask you a question, but I'm going to put two together because I want to make sure that you get to it before we end in, in less than 10 minutes. Um, one, besides stop eating, you know, the fast food with all the antibiotics in it, if you're, if you're taking a course of antibiotics, what's the best way to, to recover it in a healthy way and quickly? And then I want you to tell everybody, because it is in the title of the panel, what is SIBO and what is IBS and how do people get it? And how do people resolve it? We'll try to wrap it or wrap it in an we'll easy way. So I, yeah. If you take yeah. an antibiotics. 10 minutes. Yes. So eat lots of fiber and eat probiotic rich foods. Um, we used to recommend taking a probiotic while you were taking antibiotics. And they did a study a few years ago that actually found those who did that took longer to recover their natural microbiome. So don't necessarily take a probiotic at the same time that you're taking an antibiotic, but eat small amounts of probiotics in these foods that also come with the food for them, the prebiotic fiber. Um, and then, you know, if you're having issues after following an antibiotic course, you can definitely consider taking a probiotic at that time to re-inoculate your gut. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add. To and that. Just, just an analogy I think is great because we all have native species. So mm -hmm. we're all unique ecosystem. So the reason why, at least in theory, is that when you're adding that probiotic, those might be species that your gut really isn't used to in that abundance. So now mm -hmm. on top of you trying to recover from the antibiotics, you're throwing in these non-native species that are now competing with the species that were already there in your gut. So that, now they're getting a double whammy. And that's a theory of why this takes longer. Uh, think of it like an uh, empty plot of land in Alaska versus an empty plot of land in Mexico. You're going to see different wildflowers, different things grow, even if you just leave that land alone, versus if you go there and try to force your own flowers to grow. You know, it's totally different ecosystems. So to think you can put the same flowers there, why not just let its own native ecosystem grow back? That's the quick analogy with that. SIBO and IBS. So... IBS is irritable bowel syndrome. SIBO is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And, and we know <laughs> all SIBO is a form of irritable bowel syndrome. And irritable bowel syndrome really means that you have any change in gas, bloating, abdominal pain or discomfort or stool multiple times a month. And so if that's happening, you will receive that diagnosis of IBS. And it's called a diagnosis of exclusion because first they're going to rule out celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease. They're going to rule out anything major going on, colon cancer. And if they scope you and blood test you and there's nothing there, they'll say, I don't know, your bowel is just irritable. Um, yeah. But, you know, we expect people to go a little bit further. So now we know 14 to 70% of irritable bowel syndrome is small intestinal bacterial or microbial overgrowth. And that's just when the bugs are out of balance. Um, certain bugs will create certain gases and that can cause symptoms like diarrhea, constipation, alternating diarrhea, constipation, urgency, and pain. Um, and so that's really when you're small and large intestines could be just out of complete balance. They're not in that beautiful eubiosis we want. They're in dysbiosis. Okay, perfect. And what are your thoughts on, uh, well, actually, let, let me go with this. Um, how do you how do you treat that? How do you treat so, both of them? Yeah, good question. Um, one, it's identifying, do you have it? So breath testing is kind of the gold standard for detecting it. And, you know, we do in our practice, a trio smart breath test, because it looks at all three types of SIBO. So it will help us identify which type do you have, because then we can understand which bugs you probably have. And then we can create certain treatments for that. So antimicrobials are something that people can use. They have created certain antibiotics that really will just target for example, E. coli will create hydrogen SIBO. Um, so they do have antibiotics that are not broad spectrum. They're just absorbed in the small intestine and they will just target E. coli and Klebsiella, two bugs that make hydrogen gas. Um, so, or, you know, maybe if you have hydrogen sulfide SIBO, you've added a binder like bismuth to it. So first it's testing then knowing what you have and how much of it you that you have and getting back into balance. Then you want to recover your motility and then your gut barrier. And so what I'll say is that's where you can go to a gastro 
and and there are more and more gastros that can identify and give you an antibiotic, but really that's kind of where it ends for a lot of people. We take it a step further. So what we find are patients coming to us going, I've, I'm now on my third antibiotic course for SIBO and it keeps coming back. So the second part to this, which is a very, very important piece is the lifestyle change and nutrition. So that's what we've developed in our practice, mm -hmm. which is going, hey, we're not only going to identify, properly treat, but we're also going to ask the whys, why did this happen in the first place? properly get your nutrition in line to repair the gut structure, function, and motility. That way, long-term, you're able to add back as many foods as possible, bring back your native diversity, and never, hopefully never have to deal with this again versus the alternate route, which is like just continue on course after course of antibiotic or go on such a strict elimination diet that you never come back for it or from it. That's essentially what we're seeing with this carnivore movement. I think it's a lot of people who are having gut issues. They've eliminated, 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 and now they're just stuck eating. I can only eat eggs, butter, and different forms of meat. Otherwise, I feel bloated, gassy. I don't feel well. It's essentially they've dug themselves in a hole so deep that they can no longer see the light. And they're just like, this is my lifestyle, and I'm going to build a brand around it, right? Where it's like, yeah, there, there's more to that story for sure. So if I can understand what you're saying with regard to to the elimination diet leading to eating meat, there they haven't really figured out what the bacterial balance is and the issue that they're having. So they're starving all of the bacteria, fiber, and and their food. So they're only eating they're they're eating meat, which doesn't really feed the bacteria, so they don't get the symptoms that they're having with the the bad bacteria. Is that yeah? It's not fermentable like fibers are. So these microbes aren't then creating the byproduct because if they're not really feeding off of something, um, they're kind of putrefying the meat, and if anything, but they're not really fermenting it because then they can't extract nutrients from it. Then they can't create their postbiotics from it. So that is why diets like that will be helpful. What was the name of the test that you said? A trio smart test. And that's the something. Test is something, it sounded like you said Okay. What, yes, what, a trio smart breath test. And we do offer that in our practice. Breath test, like you're breathing? Uh, okay. You breathe into these bags. You just send them samples of your breath. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a yes and no question, although I'm sure you're going to want to add more to it, but I want to get to at least one of our, uh, yes. our, our participants. Fermented foods, yes or no? Yes. All Four right. to six a day. All right. Very good. I'm going to throw it out to Janet M. Please. Uh, Ask your question, Janet. Okay, yeah, I was just wondering, what are your thoughts about digestive enzymes? Do you think those are a good idea or not really? And also, like, how much water do you feel like people should be drinking for good digestion and also weight loss? These are great questions. I think in the right context, yeah, digestive enzymes can be really helpful. So you want to ask yourself, um, do you have anything that's predisposing you to decreasing enzymes? So certain autoimmune conditions decrease saliva production and they will then benefit from digestive enzymes because they're not making them there. Or if somebody has diabetes, type one, type two diabetes and their pancreas is overwhelmed, sometimes it's not making enough digestive enzymes. So a lot of my type one diabetics do need digestive enzymes. If someone has had SIBO or gut dysbiosis or leaky gut, we make a large percentage of enzymes as well in the lining of the small intestine. So someone like that also could benefit from taking a digestive enzyme. If you find benefit in the digestive enzyme, that's great. It's I always just encourage someone to really understand why it's helpful for them. So that way they know how long do I need to be on this? Is this indefinite for me? Why did I get here? And you know, I'm glad that it's helping. And regarding water, um, I always say at least half of your body weight in pounds in ounces to just to ensure that you're hydrating the fiber that you're consuming every day and that your stool is well hydrated. Um, because if you're eating lots of starch and soluble fiber foods, you want to make sure that you have the proper water to hydrate them. So that way your body can properly break them down, digest them and do what it needs to do with them. All right. Well, I, I really wish we had more time. All these hands are going up. I got people messaging me with, with questions all of a sudden. <laughs> Uh, maybe we'll have to do a three-hour panel one of these days. But <laughs> yeah. thank you so much 
for uh, for everything and all the information that you shared. And I think I made this joke the other day that uh, uh, that you must be really fun at a at a dinner party. But I think you I probably know. are actually. I think we are. I think yeah. We'll always we bring up fun. what will happen after the dinner party. <laughs> yeah. Great, great. I'm sure they love that. Thank you for having us. Our pleasure. If we could unmute the audience, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.